So the recovery after foot and ankle surgery is a stepwise approach. Uh, the first thing you want to do is get your wound to heal, which takes about two weeks or so. And then if you've had a bony procedure where we've operated on the bone and relying on bony healing to take place, then that's the second step to get the bone to heal. And that can take two or three months. And then finally, uh, the last step and the longest step is recovering back to a reasonable um, degree of function. Now, these time periods are based specifically on the surgery that takes place. Um, so these guidelines are not set in stone and it's important to listen to your surgeon um, and it'll always be dictated by the specific procedure that you have. But generally, one thing that one must keep in mind throughout the entire recovery process is the swelling that's associated with foot and ankle surgery. So in the first couple of weeks while you're trying to get the, the wounds to recover, I've got a few uh, tips and tricks and some catchphrases that I, that I like to use. And one of them is to keep it high. So keep your foot and ankle elevated. And ideally, you want um, your foot and ankle above the level of your heart. So my phrase for that is get your toes above your nose. And you wanna be keeping it high for a lot of time, especially initially in those first couple of weeks. So my advice is about 45 minutes of every hour is spent with your foot and ankle elevated. Now that might be for the full two weeks of the wound healing, or it might be a bit less than that, depending on the procedure that you've had. But basically you wanna get up for tea, toast and toilets and mobilize for necessity, not for pleasure. Uh, it's important during those uh, couple weeks when the wound is healing also is to keep it dry. Um, so you might be in a plaster, but you'll certainly be in some dress dressings, which we don't want to get wet. We want to keep them clean. Uh, and it's important to uh, protect those dressings um, while you perform your personal hygiene. And there are products available that can help you elevate it uh, and to cover it when you're, um, um, when you're recovering. And that's something that might be important in terms of your preparation for the surgery. So having things in place um, at your home to help you elevate your foot and ankle uh, and help keep uh, the uh, operated area and or your cast clean and dry can be important to get a hold of before you have your surgery. And also it's important to put some thoughts into how you're gonna spend those, uh, particularly the first couple of weeks with your foot elevated. So you don't want to have to go up and down a lot of stairs to get to the bathroom. Um, you want easy food and drink that's accessible to you and doesn't require too much preparation with your foot hanging down. Um, and for those things, there are different um, things that one can purchase or obtain um, that can help you do that. The other things to um, try to think about are how to optimize the healing environment. So if you're a smoker, uh, it's important to stop smoking ahead of foot and ankle surgery. Um, generally, for me personally, I recommend the patients stop smoking for at least three months before their surgery and stay off of um, uh, smoking uh, for until at least the bone heals. And ideally, you can stay off of it forever, which will mean that you live longer as well, of course, and have a better quality of life uh, later on in your life. Um, there's good evidence to suggest that smoking increases the risk of wound complications and also uh, inhibits bone healing if your operation relies on bone healing to occur. Um, with diabetes, uh, if you are a diabetic, it's important to have your blood sugars under good control and have um, evidence of this as a blood test, which is called HbA1c, uh, which uh, gives an idea of how well controlled your diabetes is in the background. And again, there's evidence to suggest that diabetes is poorly controlled, is associated with uh, wound healing problems, as well as bone healing problems. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, so I just want to show you a, a couple of pictures of um, some things that can help. So this is a demonstration of a, uh, a patient who's had some foot and ankle surgery and they're elevating it. So the toes are at the level of their nose. The elevation keeps the knee below the foot and ankle. Um, 
and the hip is also below the foot and ankle. And it's important to not have the knee above the foot and ankle when, uh, when you're trying to control the swelling because then the blood supply will have to go uphill and then back downhill. So that's quite an important thing to keep in mind. In regards to keeping the area clean and dry, there are products that um, one can get that cover uh, the uh, leg so that you can uh, shower um, while um, protecting your wounds. In terms of uh, mobilizing, generally the standard things that are given are uh, crutches or in some cases frames. However, this can be difficult, particularly for people who don't have very good upper body strength and can be limiting. And there are other products that are available such as uh, on the left here, this is a, a knee crutch, which will allow some people to get a bit more independent. And then on the right hand side is a knee scooter um, which uh, can, can help people get around as well. And this gives you a little bit more independence, particularly after those first two weeks of the wound healing, uh, so that uh, you, know, you can live a bit more of your life. But you do have to remember that the knee, uh, the, the foot is below the hip and it's not elevated while you're using these. So um, one must be careful to avoid uh, excessive swelling uh, using these um, sort of devices. Um, yeah, so during those first couple of weeks, um, because we don't want swelling to occur, um, we don't want to have the, the, the foot and ankle down for too long. And generally, the type of pain that people experience uh, will be, there'll be a background pain from the, from the surgery taking place. And um, when you do have the surgery, you'll generally wake up and there'll be some local anesthetic uh, in the region or above the region depending on the procedure you've had to help um, uh, control pain. But when that uh, local anesthetic block wears off, it's important to be on top of your painkillers regularly for the first uh, five days or so. Again, depending on the procedure, the length of time you'll need regular painkillers will vary. Um, but then after that um, initial period, you won't need your painkillers as, as frequently. And besides that sort of background of discomfort from the surgery, if you are getting additional throbbing pain, um, and certainly if you're getting any discoloration in your toes, that's usually due to the fact that the uh, foot and ankle has been down for too long and needs to be elevated. And you really want to avoid having it down and causing those sorts of problems. One strategy that you can use also is to ice it. And with all those dressings on the foot, sometimes it's difficult to deliver the coolness of the ice to the operating area. Um, so a strategy that one can use is uh, you can put the ice pack not directly on the skin. There should always be some sort of uh, layer between the, the cold, uh, cold mechanism you use, like either ice in a bag or a uh, cold compress uh, to avoid it directly touching the skin, such as a, some of the ice packs come with special covers or you can use a tea towel. Uh, but putting it in, onto an area where the arteries leading to and the veins coming from the foot and ankle are, uh, can deliver cooler blood uh, to that area, such as the artery behind your knee or on the inner side of your ankle, and that can sometimes help. Um, one must avoid smoking um, to help the wounds heal as much as possible. And also, if you are a diabetic, keeping your blood sugars under good control uh, will help the wound healing process um, occur. So strict bed rest is rarely prescribed for the recovery. Um, the first uh, couple of weeks, as mentioned before, uh, it's important to keep it elevated, but you don't want to be uh, bed bound uh, because that increases the chance of you getting medical complications from being bed bound. Um, it increases your risk of developing clots in the legs, which can jump up to the lungs and those can be life threatening. Um, it's important to avoid being completely immobile um, as a result of that. Um, so there are certain things that I generally tell patients to look out for, particularly in the first couple of weeks after the procedure. And those are mainly around the serious complications, which are fortunately quite rare. And those are mainly surrounding infections and clots. So if you experience a fever, you have redness coming up past your dressings, uh, it's very important to seek medical attention. 
And also if your calf becomes swollen, you get shortness of breath or chest pain, that could be an indicator of a clot in the leg or the lung, which again needs medical attention. After the first two weeks, the risk of an infection is a little bit lower, but the risk of a clot continues and seems to stabilize from six weeks onwards. So you may be given uh, some injections or tablets to help thin the blood. Uh, what will always occur is when you're being uh, listed and considered for foot and ankle surgery, a risk assessment of your clot risk needs to take place. And the clinician and yourself will make a decision whether or not it's appropriate um, to give you uh, any uh, medication on top of other mechanical things like stockings or pumps um, to reduce your risk of clots. Um, so some foot and ankle surgery, you're allowed to start walking pretty much right after the procedure, bearing in mind the elevation instructions that we've talked about previously. Um, in those cases, you'll usually be given a special shoe that goes on top of your dressings. But in other cases, um, you'll be asked to non-weight bear, and you may be spending some time in a plaster or a boot. Um, generally, um, when you uh, spend a period of time non-weight bearing, uh, you need to gradually return to full weight bearing within the plaster or boot, um, and then eventually progress that. So my instructions generally are when you're going from non-weight bearing to full weight bearing, do it through a graduated process. Now, there's many ways to do that, but my suggestion is that you uh, weigh yourself with your plaster or splint on, uh, you divide that number by four, um, and then you use the scales that you use to weigh yourself to get an understanding of what that pressure feels like underneath the foot that you've, ha you've had operated on. And during the first two weeks, that's the most weight you put onto it. Two weeks into that process, uh, you repeat the process again. So you weigh yourself again, but this time you divide it by two. Uh, and then you familiarize yourself with uh, how much pressure that feels like on the bathroom scales again. And you progress to that amount of weight over the following two weeks. Now, in terms of practicalities, 50% body weight means that essentially you can stand on it evenly. But the minute your um, non-operated side leaves the floor, if you're taking a step, that will be 100% weight bearing. So you, you'll need your mobility aids for that process. After those two weeks of the 50% weight bearing has taken place, now you can put full weight, bear, uh, full weight bearing through it as long as it's comfortable, uh, still within your plaster or splint. Uh, during that stage, um, it's particularly if you're going outdoors. And then once your time in your plaster or boot has finished, generally what I tend to recommend is you try indoors without uh, the boots. Um, and then once you're comfortable doing that, then venturing outdoors without the boots. And when you do go out outdoors, um, it's important to be um, very gradual um, with how you approach things. So this is a case where you want to be the tortoise and not the hare and be rushing into more than your foot and ankle can handle. Um, so I recommend either starting with a short time or a short distance to walk over and then gradually increasing that amount of time or distance you're walking outdoors uh, depending on your swelling and your comfort levels. And if you get too much swelling, you really want to dial it back, but ideally you want to be preventing swelling from occurring. The most common thing I see that people um, run into in terms of problems when they're they've come out of their boot or shoe or splints is that um, they do certain amounts of activity, but it increases their swelling. And as a result of that, they get discomfort. So again, it's very important to have some patience with the recovery. Um, you want to be the tortoise and not the hare, um, and you want to prevent that swelling. Uh, other things that you can do to support your healing is um, to avoid smoking and uh, secondhand smoke. Uh, that can get in the way of bone healing. Uh, it can get in the way of, way of wound healing. And especially if you're having a procedure done on your 
uh, on your bones, it may be worthwhile to take vitamin D supplementation. And um, it may be uh, useful even before the operation to have your vitamin D levels checked. And if uh, those are low, uh, you may need a higher dose of vitamin D to bring you to normal levels so that the bone healing environment is good as well. Um, and it's important to supplement that with a diet that's rich in calcium. Um, on the topic of vitamins, there's some evidence that uh, taking vitamin C, 500 milligrams twice a day for the 50 days following surgery, can reduce your risk of a condition called complex regional pain syndrome, where there's hypersensitivity around and beyond uh, the region of the operation, which can be quite debilitating and is, um, uh, is difficult to predict when it happens, and it's very difficult to treat when it does occur. Um, and vitamin C is a cheap and simple way of potentially reducing that, which there is some evidence base for, uh, but it doesn't make the risk zero. Um, in terms of going back to driving, um, you need to ultimately be able to do an emergency stop and operate the pedals uh, without pain to go back to driving. Now, if you've had your left foot and ankle operated on and you drive an automatic car, you may be able to get back to driving uh, sooner, but otherwise you'll need to be out of your cast uh, post-op shoe or boot in order to go back to driving safely. Uh, you will need to check with your insurance company and also ensure that um, your, your boot or cast has enough room in your foot well uh, before you go back to driving, if it's an automatic and you'll be, uh, and it's your left side you had operated on, to make sure that your insurance company is happy uh, for you to do that. Uh, in terms of uh, work, um, generally I advise that while the wound healing is taking place for the first couple of weeks or so, that people take uh, off of work completely. Uh, once the wound is healed, there may be room, especially if you have a desk job or an office based job of reducing level of activities to prevent swelling. However, people who have jobs where they're required to be on their feet a lot or are um, in laboring industries or much more physically demanding jobs, then you'll need more time off work. And the exact time will depend on the surgery that you've had. Um, and this will need to take into account any rehabilitation or physiotherapy plans that have been made around your surgery. But overall, the recovery and return back to uh, normal function can take as little as six months if you've had um, lesser surgery, but it can take nine months to a year if you had more major surgery. And if the recovery for that seems unpalatable um, and um, it's too long to wait, uh, one needs to really go back to the beginning and think whether or not the surgery is worthwhile having at the present time. And ultimately, what I like to ask the patients is, is the juice worth the squeeze? 